On August 9, 1974, the United States had its first president who was not elected as either president or vice president. Some were upset about it, but it was all constitutional, and Gerald Ford was a winsome figure and didn't seem to have many enemies. The longtime congressman brought his family into the White House, and for two and a half years, the Fords were admired as wholesome, decent folks. This episode of History Hunter's Signature Edition will explain how a letter and signed photo from the White House in 1975 caused a gangly teenage boy in California to fall head over heels for the daughter of the President of the United States. Like most teenage boys, I had my fair share of celebrity crushes. Years before my brother hung that famous poster of Farrah Fawcett on our bedroom wall, I was smitten by Maureen McCormick, the long-legged Marsha Brady on The Brady Bunch. However, it was embarrassing when word leaked out that I also had a crush on Shirley Jones during the 1970-1974 run of The Partridge Family. I know, that's weird given the fact that Jones was six years older than my mother. Perhaps but I can't think of any guy who wouldn't find Jones an absolute beauty, especially in musicals like Carousel and Oklahoma. In time, I would fixate on someone much closer to my age, Susan Ford, the daughter of the president. She was four years older than me. Susan Ford was born on July 6, 1957, and grew up in a political family. She was the only daughter of the family and was the apple of her dad's eye. Gerald Ford was elected to Congress in 1949 in Michigan's 5th Congressional District. He served in Congress for 25 years, the final nine of them as House Minority Leader. In 1964, Ford was selected to be a member of the high-profile Warren Commission to investigate the assassination of President Kennedy. In December 1973, just two months after the resignation of Spiro Agnew, Ford became the first president appointed to the vice presidency under the terms of the 25th Amendment. After the resignation of President Nixon in August 1974, Ford immediately assumed the presidency. Up until the White House years, Susan grew up in the same house in Alexandria, Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. In fact, for 10 days into the presidency, the Fords still lived at 514 Crownview Drive. The 1970s was a grand time to collect autographs through the mail. Personal attention was given to many of my requests, and being a good letter writer at my age also helped. It always thrilled me to open the mailbox to find a large manila envelope with the printed words White House, Washington, and stamped photo do not bend. A new administration meant exciting new opportunities to fire off letters to our new president, First Lady Betty Ford, and their four children, Jack, Michael, Steve, and Susan. In May 1975, Susan Ford answered my letter and sent along a signed 8x10 color photo. It was puppy love at first sight. Susan was looking over her right shoulder, wearing a powder blue sweater, hugging onto her Siamese cat. I remained smitten by her beauty, but as a painfully shy and geeky 8th grader, I came to terms that Susan Ford was out of my league. For months, I was convinced there was no finer-looking woman than Susan Ford, wholesome and innocent. It was a matte finish romance like no other and often would place my hand where her hand rested while she inscribed my name. I read and reread her letter on White House stationery. Judging by how my questions were answered, it seemed that Susan actually read and personally answered my mail. I wanted to know what it was like to go from an unknown teenager and thrust into the White House and national limelight and whether or not she was bothered by Secret Service closing in on her privacy. On May 13, 1975, the 17-year-old daughter of the President of the United States wrote, Dear Jeff, thank you for your letter and for telling me a little bit about yourself. I appreciated your kind comments. Being the president's daughter really isn't as bad as some people imagine. I believe it is up to each individual to make the best of whatever his personal situation happens to be. Personally, I'm doing my best just being myself while still keeping in mind that being the president's daughter has certain obligations such as being interviewed, answering mail, and acting as hostess. So far, I've even managed to hang on to my usual routine of going to school during the day, waiting knee-deep in homework in the evenings, and spending weekends with my friends. Even my Secret Service agents usually don't bother me. As they put it, they're there to watch what the people around me are doing, not what I'm doing. I'm enclosing an autographed picture as you requested and hope it makes a nice addition to your collection. With best wishes, Susan Ford. Best wishes sounded too informal. Heck, this was love. But it was a relief to hear that the Secret Service agents were keeping their prying eyes off my girl. 
About a month later, shock hit me like an amped up cattle prod when I opened up our local newspaper to see a front page photo and story about Susan Ford being in Yosemite to study with famous photographer Hansel Adams. We live just 93 miles from Yosemite and went there often, and my teenage heart was pained that I missed seeing Susan Ford. Adding to the heartache was the possibility that she may have passed within a half mile of my house on the route to Yosemite if she were traveling from San Francisco. I watched Susan Ford from print, jealous as she was dancing with guys at the prom held at the White House. Ironically, we got to visit the White House in August 1975, and there was no sign of the president or Susan. Darn it. On November 30th, 1976, the 18-year-old Susan Ford decided to do something mischievous by putting her Secret Service agents to the test. As agents were gathered in the West Wing, Susan raced down the corridor to escape out the White House and drove her yellow Ford Mustang as agents were completely unaware of a security lapse. She drove through the gates which had been opened for the arrival of First Lady Betty Ford once successfully escaping the clutches of the nation's most trained security force and the impenetrable fortress of the White House grounds, young Ford thought to herself, now what do I do? At the time, she was attending Mount Vernon College, so she drove to pick up her best friend in the dorm room, bought beer at a local Safeway, and drank it in the parking lot. The euphoria of being off the Secret Service radar quickly evaporated when she remembered that she had plans to attend a Hall & Oates concert that night and one of her agents had the tickets. So Susan Coyley called the White House and offered to report in at 7 p.m. to get the tickets, but was headed off with this ominous response, your father would like to see you. When she returned to the White House dinner table, President Ford told her, don't do that again and the matter was over. Betty Ford, it seems, was completely oblivious to the fact that her daughter was missing for three hours. At the concert that night, a smile broke out onto Susan Ford's face at the obvious irony when Daryl Hall and John Oates sang their hit, She's Gone. As the president's daughter, Susan Ford found herself thrust in the limelight of the White House. She was invited to ride in parades across the country, appeared in magazine ads for Subaru, and on the cover of magazines, including People magazine, featuring a photo that I would know all too well. She also campaigned hard for her dad to remain in the White House. Her two and a half years in the White House came to a stinging end when the president lost the election to Jimmy Carter in 1976. Susan chose the career pathway of a photojournalist and was hired to shoot for magazines, and she was also hired to shoot publicity stills for the blockbuster film Jaws 2. After her mother's much-publicized battle with alcoholism and the founding of the Betty Ford Center, Susan did her part in 2005 by becoming the chair of the organization. The photo of Susan Ford has faded from its original luster despite my best attempts to keep it pristine. As with most crushes, I got over Susan Ford in time. Girls within my small hometown circle became my focus and Susan Ford, at first flame, faded with her dad into the history books. When I read that Susan Ford was marrying Secret Service agent Charles Vance in 1978, I remembered her letter to me in which she rather ironically mentioned how Secret Service agents weren't watching her. Yeah, right. Apparently, Charlie had his eye on Susan. 16 years her senior, the union lasted a decade. During her marriage to Charles Vance, Susan became a mother to two daughters, Tyne Mary Vance, born in 1980, and Heather Elizabeth Vance Devers in 1983. She later remarried attorney Vaden Bales in 1989. When Gerald Ford died in 2006, my thoughts turned to my long lost crush. During the televised funeral service, I scanned the crowd for her. She was older, but she still was beautiful. Time had a way of making her more strongly resemble her famous dad. As a member of the president's family, Susan Ford attended a number of funerals, including the ceremony for former First Lady Lady Bird Johnson in 2007. In 2010, 53-year-old Susan Ford went to the gym to exercise, while on the elliptical machine, she went into a sudden cardiac arrest. A surgeon just happened to be walking into the building at the time and revived her with a defibrillator. She recovered and now lives with a pacemaker. She had no prior knowledge that she had heart disease. Now a grandmother, Susan Ford has been a force for good, speaking out on alcohol addiction and offering hope for addicts, as well as creating awareness of heart health. She also has been a sponsor for the aircraft carrier, the USS Gerald Ford, commissioned in 2017, and has even helped to weld the ship together. Thanks for joining Back in Time with us on this episode of History Hunter's Signature Edition. 
please give us a like, leave a comment if you please, and subscribe to our channel. Thank you so much.